Hey, fellow Mathers, before we get into this episode, we want to share with you how you can get access to free content, professional learning that will keep your students engaged and doing the math that matters. Get ready to go to this link, mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. That's right. Registration is open for the free Math is Figure Outable challenge that's starting May 15th and runs to the 17th at 7 p.m. Central. We're going to have three nights jam-packed with learning and routines that you can take straight to your classroom. In these challenges, we have a great time. We do some math, talk about classroom experiences, give away super cool bonuses and prizes. You won't just walk away with routines that are naturally engaging and encourage your students to think mathematically. You'll also have a chance to win over 6 k worth in prizes, including a few virtual PD sessions for your school. I'll be joined by my wonderful co-host, Kim, and special guest, Jenna Laib. You can register at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge for a fantastic learning experience. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Now on to the show. Hey, fellow mathematicians. Welcome to the podcast where math is figureoutable. I'm Pam. And I'm Kim. And we make the case that mathematizing is not about mimicking steps or memorizing facts. Y'all, it's about thinking and reasoning, about creating and using mental relationships. We take the strong stance that not only are algorithms not particularly helpful in teaching, but that mimicking algorithms actually keep students from being the mathematicians they can be. We answer the question, if not algorithms and step-by-step procedures, then what? So last week, we started a conversation about what makes a rich task rich. And of course, we have plenty of things to say about all the things. So we decided that we would pick up where we left off and talk some more about rich tasks this week. Yeah. So if you haven't listened to last episode, check it out because we go through some lists and describe some things, some ways of thinking about what makes a rich task rich. Today, we'd like to give maybe some examples and further exemplify kind of what we talked about with those lists and maybe also talk a little bit about what we think rich tasks are not. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start by talking about, um, I had a conversation once with Glenda Lappin, who I give a lot of credit to her and Betty Phillips and the whole Connected Math Project team for creating, I think, some wonderful rich tasks. And one of the things that she and I talked about was that they really tried for contexts that made sense to students, things Mm -hmm. that students could relate to, that they actually gave students surveys um, to find out what students were interested in, what they thought about, Mm -hmm. what things that that could help them sort of realize the math. And then they tried to stick those contexts where they made sense as they created rich tasks, not Mm -hmm. in a fake kind of a uh, weird way, but I think they did a fantastic job of doing things with pizza and video game reaction times. I love that. Mm. And bicycles, shoes, clothes, amusement park rides, um, Olympic times and scores, like just to name a few of some of the wonderful contexts that they use that uh, could help make those rich tasks where the help make the math realizable. Not that it has to be real world, but just things that what kids were interested in that would sort of perk some interest. Yeah. I, I, I honored the fact that they were actually uh, thinking about Not just real world, but things that would be sort of interesting to kids. And then let's be clear, they did not make them too uh, hokey, not too like try to try to force the math into the context. Uh, Often they would they they sometimes had contexts that were more whimsical or more uh, sort of fantastical. Sometimes they had them purely mathematical. So it's not about making everything real world. But I did honor the fact that they thought about if there were ways they could use things that were um, that that interest teenagers, you know, like young, yeah. like middle school kids. I thought that was pretty cool. Well, not only did they think about it, but they actually surveyed kids, right? That's really cool. And yeah. it's not, you know, you're, you're talking about that. And it makes me think about how not too terribly long ago, uh, one of my sons came home and his, um, teacher <laughs> tried really hard, right. To, to make the assignment be like something the kids can connect to by putting her students' names in the worksheet. And so it was like, uh, you know, my, my son's teacher, I would have his name in one of the problems, but sure, you know, yeah. you, you run into that risk of like what happened with my son is that he was like, uh, this is a problem about me, but I totally do not like the thing that it's supposed to be talking about oh, me liking. Shit. I was like, Oh, Oops. sorry, buddy. Like, oh, sorry. <laughs> it happens. 
It happens, yeah. So it's it's a little less of that, maybe, and a little more of like if we could put something in a context that um, might might make it relatable for kids, mm-hmm. that that mm-hmm. might be a thing to to try if we could. An example that I'll use from my work, um, I, I've said before, I'm a curriculum designer. I think that that's a very interesting place to be in education because I have to think about a lot of things and think about the mathematical terrain and and how to make a rich task rich. And I was seeking for, so uh, we mentioned maybe a little bit before that we're creating right now a building powerful linear functions high school workshop. It'll be an online mm-hmm. workshop. It'll launch in the fall of 2022. Very excited about it. I think it's in my best work. And as we were writing and piloting and testing and rewriting and revamping, um, I became really clear that a lot of work that I'd been doing and working with people was having kids write functions for discrete situations. And I just got kind of mathematical on you there. So, so hold tight. Uh, a function is by nature often continuous. So it should ideally represent continuous data, not broken up data or not discrete data. Discrete data is like, like um, individual points of data that doesn't tend to like time is continuous, right? Distance measurement is continuous, but we could have um, other data like numbers of dogs, uh, you know, how number, numbers of pets that you have, that would be more discrete data. And so often we were doing things with discrete data that we were having kids write continuous functions to model that data. And, and that can be an okay thing if there are trends that we want to look at and, and, and some things. But I really wanted the first time that I was going to have a group of Algebra 1 students write a, a function. I wanted it to be for data that was at least felt continuous. So I was seeking for a measurement context. Like I really wanted to have a measurement because measurement is continuous, right? Depends on how precise you want to get with the measurement. Um, and so I thought really hard about that. And y'all, I worked for quite a while looking at what context would be somewhat intriguing to kids. I had Glenda Lappin on my mind and what could be something that kids could, could relate to, but the math could be realizable through. And then we, I realized, Ooh, I could do it with frozen yogurt. That, mm-hmm. that was a, a, a thing that was popping up around. We had one just in our, our little town where you could go, you take the cup, put it underneath the, the spigot thing, and you could put as much of that yogurt in, and then you could go to the next, put in much of, you know, you could choose different kinds of yogurt. And then there was this whole topping bar, and then you paid by weight. And so if you've ever had an experience with that, uh, there was a, it was a really nice context where we could talk about the, the price could be uh, dependent on the cone that you put it in, whether it was a waffle cone or a dipped waffle bowl or not dipped waffle bowl, uh, those cost different amounts, or you just put it in a cup. Um, and then how much uh, yogurt, you, that was sort of the, the fixed cost. And then how much yogurt that you put in the cup would depend on, on how much your yogurt would cost. And so that was a, a scenario, a situation that I was like, oh, this could work. But then I had to think about equity. I had to think about the fact that we would have students conceivably who didn't live anywhere near a frozen yogurt shop. What could we do to make sure that that scenario, that context was relatable enough for students? So we shot this really cool video um, where d- down at our local frozen yogurt shop where the owner talked to us all about all the math that she had to consider as, uh, as she priced different toppings and, and the way that they were priced and zeroing out the scale when they measured the, or the, when they weighed the yogurt. It was awesome. It was a great conversation. So we shot this video. And so one of the um, rich tasks that I use is this idea of writing a function for the, the cost of frozen yogurt, depending on how much frozen yogurt I, I put in the depending on whether it's a cup or a bowl or a, a, a dipped waffle bowl. And so then we thought if we show this video, we, we give kids this experience where they get to feel that, then we thought we had written what, what could be an example of a good, rich task. And I'll, I'll leave maybe the, the end of that, the way that we got them to write that function was <laughs> really kind of clever. Um, but that's an example of some things that I thought about while I was creating yeah. a rich task. What, what could be a context that, that could be um, intriguing for kids or, and, and make the math realizable. So it fit the mathematics, but also what's a way that then we could give kids experience so that we had equity, that we had, everybody could dive in. Everybody could be able to make sense of what was happening in the scenario. And it sounds like you spent a lot of time thinking about that, right? It's not like a super quick, 
just like whip something up. It was de- no, definitely not. In fact, I tried several different things and, and then pilot tested several different things. And then once we um, sort of decided frozen yogurt was the thing, then we pilot tested different ways of, uh, of giving kids the experience and also different ways of asking the questions to make sure that, that what we got was kids actually thinking about, huh, well, I could solve that. But I, I don't know how to I don't know how to solve that one because you like you haven't told me how much oh I could I could represent all of them, and that's becoming an increasingly important conversation for me in high school math is how could I represent all of the scenarios mm-hmm. or how could I represent all of the possibilities then becomes that linear function a linear function represents for any x what would the outputs be for any yeah. X in this scenario. So that became a really important question that we, we found after researching and, and pilot testing different ways of, of writing that um, rich task. So Kim, if that's a way of thinking about what rich tasks are, what are they not? What are some things that we agree rich tasks don't have? Mm. So, you know, I was thinking about this not too long ago, actually, because we like to think about problems, right? And so <laughs> if, if they're kind of fun or interesting, but they don't lead somewhere, um, you, you talked about the fact that you love that they lead somewhere in last week's episode, mm-hmm. but if they're fun and interesting, but they don't, they don't kind of mathematically go anywhere, that's not going to be a rich task, right? If they don't have the extensions that I love, um, then it's also probably not a rich task. And the reason I was thinking about this is because we have a teammate who loves to um, throw out some problems in our communication. We slack, but our communication. And they're fun to do and think about and talk about, but we don't consider them a rich task because they're not really connected. They're kind of in isolation. They don't really go anywhere. It's just a single problem that you might tinker with a little bit. Um, and that, and it just kind of lands. That's where it is. So to be clear, we're not saying don't ever do those. Don't ever throw them out. Don't ever work with students. It's just that when we talk about curriculum design and we talk about how you sort of set up a unit of study and we say, Ooh, like it should be centered around rich tasks. What we don't mean are those things that you just said, uh, things that aren't aren't extendable, that they they don't have, um, they don't lead, lead somewhere that they're fun in, in, in themselves. But when we want to kind of focus or center our our sequence of tasks around a rich task, uh, that's not what we mean. Yeah. And it's probably not something, a, a rich task might not be something that you do every single day because they're not the easiest, like you mentioned earlier, they're not the easiest <laughs> to write or to find, right? It's not mm-hmm. like you're going to do a fresh rich task every single day, but you might have a sequence where a rich task is the center and you might do some problem strings leading up to it. You might back out of it with a problem string or some other kind of routine. And then we really like, we really like those rich tasks that you can build from, right. Yeah. That, that have like a yep. second step to that. A second, like, yep. Ooh, what if we, and I think we'll mention a couple of examples of those in just a minute. Yeah. So I, I know, you know, this, but, um, Kathy Fosno's 10 day units are some of my very favorite rich tasks. When, when you and I were writing, it was, it was a lot easier to spend the time to come up with really rich tasks. And so I don't, I never recommend to teachers like, oh, just go whip some out real fast. What I recommend is that they use and take kind of their discernment to parse out, is this that I'm finding a rich task? Is it going to be the best use of my time with my students rather than to create their own? Although I've, I have seen some people come up with some really good ones, but Fosno's 10 day units are definitely um, the top of my list. They're yeah. meaty, they're rich. Kathy Fosno is a master mm-hmm. at writing incredibly, uh, what's, a, what's a good word? Just well-written, well-planned, well-developed, extendable. Um, mm-hmm. They go somewhere. They have. They are replete with patterns. Um, I, I think I have learned so much from doing her rich tasks and thinking about the sequencing that she's done with rich tasks. So really, my hat is off. I think she's a master curriculum designer. And so some of our favorites, uh, we really like her sub sandwich investigation. It's so well done. I've tried to do kind of a version where I, I tweak the numbers and the numbers she chose are so well chosen that there's just some really cool things that can come out of it. Um, and the more that you do, uh, some examples of, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a few more examples of hers, but the more that you do rich tasks like that, the more you realize, oh, like it's, it, that this is how you can pack lots of different patterns um, because you have a, a meaty enough, like, like the sub sandwich, which we've done in episode, hmm, we'll put that in the show notes. We, we, we talked about her sub sandwich 
uh, rich task in one of our episodes early on. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we'll, we'll put that in the show notes if you want to listen to that one. Um, Also measuring for the art show, I think is super brilliant uh, about uh, helping kids conceive of and kind of uh, create the open number line as a model of themselves. Also there's, we call it the Turkey, Turkey investigations, but I think Mm -hmm. uh, her 10 day is called the big dinner. This is one that has a, is a really good example of kind of the follow-up where uh, in the big dinner, they, uh, the teacher buys a Turkey. And so it's all about finding the cost of a Turkey. And I think it's 24 pounds and the Turkey's a dollar 25 per pound and all the wonderful uh, conversation that can come out of that. And then after you've had that conversation and, and maybe followed with some problem strings or routines, then after that, then there's this, Hey, we bought the Turkey. And we had this really great Congress about how you guys were talking about how you could figure out how much the Turkey was going to cost. Well, now we got to bake the Turkey. So now we're going to mm-hmm. bake that 24 pound Turkey and uh, you're going to bake it at 15 minutes per pound. And, and now you have a quarter hour, whereas before we had a sort of a dollar and a quarter in money. And now you have a quarter hour. And oh, like the, all of those relationships. So we've got money and we've got time and we've got quarters in both of them. And, and you have a number 24 that is so rich and, and uh, so many factors and ways of, of partitioning. Anyway, there's, it's just brilliant. Uh, that, that's an, an excellent example. So we really uh, like that one. Also, um, her exploring parks and playgrounds is another one that has some fantastic uh, rich tasks in it. Um, really, I, I think, I don't, I don't know that I've ever met a 10-day unit that Kathy Fosno has written that I didn't like at least lots of it. So highly recommend that. We'll just give a couple other examples um, as you're looking. We think Bridges and Mathematics has some decent examples of rich tasks uh, at the elementary level. For middle school level, we like the Connected Math Project. We also like Math in Context, which is out of print now, I believe. But it, if you ever get a hold of a Math in Context book, it has some excellent rich tasks. Also has some really good modeling in it. Uh, for the high school level, Discovery Mathematics, Discovering Algebra, Discovering Geometry, Discovering Advanced Algebra has some excellent, and they call them investigations, uh, rich tasks. Desmos has some excellent teacher tasks uh, that I would call rich tasks. Uh, open up resources at the high school level that was created from the NVP project. Uh, so the high school level open up resources, I think has some excellent rich tasks in it. Um, I'm going to maybe end this episode talking about one more rich task that um, I've worked on. And I I got the inspiration from the Discovery Math series where they use a CBR. um, It's called a calculator based ranger, but that's not important. What's really important is it's a motion detector where they used motion detectors hooked up to a graphing calculator. And you walk or move in front of that motion detector and the resulting graph of the distance versus time, how far you are from the motion detector over time, that graph gets uh, put into the, uh, well, the data gets put into a graphing calculator and it displays a graph. And uh, when I first uh, encountered that, there were some fine sort of activities that I did kind of as part of T-Cube, the TI um, outreach to, to teach with technology. And then we've developed over time a series of rich tasks that really take advantage of that experience. So think equity. If we put a CBR in kids' hands, uh, if we put that motion detector in kids' hands and we actually ask them to walk in front of it and how your motion affects the graph, how, how you're actually making that graph change based on your motion. And then we have a series of rich tasks throughout high school where we continue to then lean back on that experience and continue to build richer and richer connections. And so as an example of that, one of those rich tasks that was an extension of the sort of beginning task where we ask kids how your walk affects the graph. And then later on, we then use that as an extension where we actually have kids write a function for their own motion. And they write sort of their first continuous function for their own motion. And it's really cool. As I was working with that task, there was a follow-up problem string that I was writing. And as I was writing that follow-up problem string, um, I was kind of fussing around. We'd already pilot tested it a bit and the results weren't quite what I was hoping for. And so I was kind of tweaking some things. And and so like what I often will do, I just called my kids. I was like, hey, hey, you, come here. You're in, a, you're in geometry. You've, you've had algebra one and it was an algebra one. It was designed to be an algebra one task. I was like, hey, kid, come over here. How would you solve this? And that kid who had already had algebra one, he was like, well, I, I can think about it this way. And Kim, I don't know if you remember this. He actually used your strategy. Mm-hmm. which I had never even thought of before. I was like, oh, okay, this is a real strategy. Kim used it. Now Craig has used it. Okay, it's a real strategy. All right, I was really thinking about it and fussing with it. Well, then I had a kid who was a senior 
and he was taking uh, physics and calculus. And so I was like, Hey, Hey you, how would you solve this problem? And he paused for a second. Matthew's really thoughtful. And he looked at me and he goes, well, do you want a calculus solution or a physics solution? I was like, yes. Okay. That means this is a really rich problem because not only can we have an algebra one solution, which Craig had used, but we could also have a calculus and physics solution that Matt was thinking about. Meanwhile, my sixth grade daughter was, was tugging on me and she was like, mom, I want to try. And I was like, whatever, what you're sixth grade. No, this is an algebra problem. Like walk away. And she's like, mom, like I want to try it. It was like, ugh. so I, in my head, I thought, fine, I'll give you the problem. You'll realize you can't do it. Then I can move on. Right. You'll quit. By <laughs> <laughs> Good mom move. Huh? Yeah. And so I was like, okay, fine, fine. Here it is. And my sixth grade daughter was like, well, and then thought through this solution I was flabbergasted. I was like, that is brilliant. Y'all, it was a transformation solution. It was a really like spatial solution that would lead to transformations and and a way of thinking about transformations with functions. And I was like, yes, that is amazing. And I realized how I could tweak the task so that more kids would, would sort of be inclined to think the way she was. And that could be one of the strategies that we brought out. And in that moment, I was like, this is a rich task. So if I just may, the hallmark, a hallmark of a rich task is that you can use different thinking that, that I could use more of a spatial approach um, to come at it. I could use more of a numeric approach to come at it. I could use more of a, um, uh, if I was described, uh, the other one is kind of a, uh, one of them was more of a step-by-step numeric, eh, not step, mm, more of a small step numeric approach. And another one was more of a You'd almost have to have more experience, but more of a global numeric approach uh, and and that I could have a calculus and a physics approach like the, the, the fact that you could come at it with different thinking that can be a hallmark of a rich task mm. because then we want to bring all those together so that we can then use different strengths of learners to come together and build all of us into more rich problem solvers. And if that intrigues you at all, y'all, that that series, that sequence of tasks is what I am putting out to the world in the Building Powerful Linear Functions Workshop, which will be debuting this fall. So fall of 2022. If you haven't checked it out yet, check out the sequence of problem strings and rich tasks and structural routines that will be coming out to teach linear functions, Building Powerful Linear Functions, fall of 2022. So excited. I can't, I'm so, <laughs> we're creating it right now and it's just Super fun. like we're getting the workshop right now. We had the tasks already. So, so excited to, to put it out to the world. Y'all, if you want to learn more math and refine your math teaching so that you and students are mathematizing more and more, then join the Math is Figure Outable movement and help us spread the word that math is figure outable. Thank you for listening and making math more figure outable. To learn even more, make sure you register for our free challenge at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. You are not going to want to miss the evenings of May 15th through 17th, starting at 7 p.m. Central. Math teaching, math teaching, go register now. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Join us to make math more and more figure outable. And if you can't join live, register and we'll send you access to the recordings. We'll see you there.